Welcome back to the Norfolk Currents Podcast. Uh, I'm Paul Rice. We're joined today by Jillian Pressman with Yimby Hampton Roads. Jillian, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, thanks for being here. So Yimby Hampton Roads is kind of a, a new chapter of a national organization. And I think a lot of folks have maybe heard of the term NIMBY, but maybe not Yimby. Can you help folks at home who've never heard of it kind of know what Yimby is and know what the broader Yimby organization is? Yeah, so... Yimby Hampton Roads is a chapter of Yimby Action, and we are the largest national organization fighting to end the housing shortage and ensure that we have abundant, affordable housing for all in communities where there's lots of jobs and opportunities. And Yimby stands for Yes in My Backyard, and it's a contrast to NIMBY, which is not in my backyard, because often... When we have conversations about housing, especially when it's like, okay, we have an opportunity to build housing in a community that has jobs and opportunities and the housing gets proposed, sometimes that conversation can turn into, well, housing's great, but I don't want housing near me, just not here, you know, and that's the not in my backyard framework. And often that conversation turns into the negatives of adding housing, which Really, the real negative about housing is just it's change and change yeah. is scary and people don't like change. But Yimby, yes, in my backyard, we focus on the positives of adding housing. And there's quite a lot of positives of adding housing. You will get, you know, communities get better. You get more vibrancy. You get more patrons for local businesses. You get, you know, more energy. You get you get more artists and more interesting cultural things to do. Um, you get more opportunity. You get, you know, hubs where you can recruit talent and hire good employees to get, you know, a good jobs economy going. So housing offers a lot of benefits. And also the consequences of not adding housing are really, really bad. And we're seeing that across the country and we're seeing it here in Hampton Roads too. So for example, if we don't add housing where there's jobs and opportunities, you get this real inequality. You get, you know, the housing gets more and more expensive because supply and demand, if you don't have a good enough supply of housing, the prices go up and up and up. So it ends up being that only really the top of the economy can afford to live there. And then all the actual foundation of your economy can't afford to live there. So your service workers, you know, your your baristas, your waitresses, your artists, your teachers, your firefighters, all the people that really make up a community and are the bedrock of the community can't afford to live there. And so you get, you know, first of all, it really stunts growth and opportunity in a yeah. region. But you also get, you know, out of control poverty. You get homelessness starts rising and that's really bad. You get, you know, some people, they, they still want to be part of the economy but they can't afford to live near the jobs. So they'll still take the job, but then they'll they'll live two hours away and they'll drive. And so then you get, first of all, all the negative health and societal consequences of really long, debilitating commutes. But you also get climate change. You get, you know, those carbon emissions are going up and up because people just have to drive really far to get places. So Yimby is yes in my backyard. We want to say yes to housing and dense, vibrant communities with lots of different people. And we want to say no to all the negatives of not having that housing, which is really, you know, staggering poverty and homelessness and environmental destruction. So that's what we do. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think probably refreshing to folks who follow some amount of local politics in civic leagues or city council planning commissions, when there is citizen input, which sometimes doesn't happen at all, it tends to be the voices who are negative, who are the loudest. And those loudest voices have a lot of outsized impact. So are you guys organizing to find projects specifically that uh, you want to be kind of in that yes column for and be kind of loudly yes? Definitely. That's definitely part of the model is to show up at housing project hearings and be the community members that are saying, yes, we want this. Because part of the problem is, you know, so you get a notice when housing is being proposed in your community. If you haven't noticed it, you do get it. It gets mailed to you. And oftentimes what happens is if you get that notice and you're like, I do not want this housing, you know, that, you know, people have all these crazy reasons. It's like, you know, there's a vacant lot right over there and my dog loves to pee in it. So I don't want to build housing there because because poor, you know, poor spot loves to pee there. So whatever it is, if you're motivated to to be against that housing, you're probably motivated to show up. So you're going to read that notice and you're going to put it on your calendar and you're going to show up. But most people, maybe you and me, will see that and we'll be like, oh, cool housing, you know, great. And you won't 
you know, you'll just forget about it because you'll be yeah. like, great, you know, hopefully it'll get built. That's fine. So what we try to do is we try to organize people like that. And we try to say, hey, actually, you do care about housing. You do want it to be built. And if you don't show up, then it's going to be the voices of no that not dominate. So let's get together. Let's attend the housing project hearing. Let's, you know, have happy hour afterwards. Let's make it fun. Let's make it social. And let's be the community members that are saying, yes, we actually want this housing. But on top of that, you know, we can't have a process where every time housing is proposed, you have endless community meetings, because even if we do what we're doing well, which is organize people to show up and say yes, it's still the process is just still going to distort for those voices of no, because it's just the incentives of showing up just really are too heavily weighted for the voices of no. So the second part of what we do, you know, we certainly show up for those housing project hearings. But the second part of what we do is we try to work for systemic change, that's going to streamline the process a little bit. So in an ideal world, housing gets decided in a community based on, you know, community planning processes. They do a they do a general plan process or they, you know, they kind of plan out where the housing, you know, how housing is going to work over the next few years. And so that, you know, we want to have that be as widely representative as possible and make a good planning process. And then if housing is proposed that follows the plan, we don't even think it maybe should get a hearing. You know, it follows the plan. It, you know, fits all the rules. It's, you know, it should certainly get inspected and, you know, the building codes and fire and all that stuff, like, for sure. But, you know, you don't necessarily need to question every decision over and over again, because once that happens, you're going to distort for those voices of no. So, Yimby, yes, we show up for housing project hearings, and we try to create a system where the path to build housing is streamlined and fair and fast and inexpensive, and we can actually build the housing that we need. Yeah, that's interesting. So advocating both on the kind of individual project side and on the policy side, and I know Yimby Hampton Roads is uh, maybe a little bit on the newer side, but uh, in other parts of Virginia, there's been some maybe some big wins for uh, the EMB organization. Can you tell us more about uh, kind of some of the traction you've seen uh, in other municipalities and other metro areas? Yeah, so EMB Hampton Roads is, I think we're about a year old at this point. We just started doing our first round of endorsements. We have a lot of new, exciting things going on. And we're connected to and learning from YIMBY Action chapters across the country. There's 49 YIMBY Action chapters. So here in Virginia, we have YIMBYs of Nova up in Northern Virginia, and then we have Richmond YIMBY, uh, RVA YIMBY, and we've been working with them. Yimbies of Nova in Arlington just got a missing middle ordinance passed. And what this means is missing middle housing is uh, basically in between your single family home, your single family detached home, and your sort of standard apartment building where you might have, you know, 10 stories apartment. In between that is what planners call missing middle housing, which is your uh, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. Um, it's kind of low density. It often looks just like a, a single family home. Like you don't even notice that actually, you know, there's two doors and it's actually two units inside one building. So they had a plan in Arlington to legalize missing middle housing in single family areas. So that means that if you have a house and you're like, you know, my kids moved out, I'm able to downsize. I want to sort of create a new unit, turn this into a duplex and create a new unit and rent it out. You're now previously you were not allowed to do that. And in actually the vast majority of municipalities, you're not allowed to do that. Single family is single family. Certainly here in Hampton Road, single family, is single family. But Yimbies of Nova helped advocate for a missing middle proposal that would make that legal. And so, and it passed, it got watered down a little bit in the political process, but it did get passed, which means that it's actually now legal to build some of these, you know, gentle density, like small, basically small apartment complexes. So that's really exciting. In Richmond, RVA EMB, they just helped pass a no parking minimums ordinance. And parking minimum in a lot of municipalities, and Hampton Roads included, the city code basically says that when you're proposing a 
housing project, you need to have a minimum level of parking. So, you know, your standard, if it's a single family home, you need to have a parking spot as part of it. Or if it's a, you know, apartment complex, you know, every unit needs to have a parking spot. Or sometimes it actually can get like really excessive. Like I've seen situations where it's like, this apartment complex, you need to have three parking spots for every single unit, which seems really excessive because if it's like, you know, a studio or a, a single bedroom, like it doesn't really make sense that you have to have three parking spots, but sometimes that's what cities impose. And so adding all that extra parking, it totally, completely drives up the costs because parking is very expensive. It limits the density that you can have because now instead of being able to build on the whole lot, you have to reserve X percentage of the lot for parking units. Many times it's really unnecessary because you'll have housing projects being proposed that are near transit and really just don't need that many parking. You know, sometimes there's housing projects that they're proposed near transit and they're for seniors who just, you know, a, a population in a lot of these cases where it's like they're they're not actually going to drive, you know, and so we don't actually need that much parking. So what the no parking minimums ordinance does is it says you can't set a parking minimum. And it's usually, you know, in areas near transit, you know, there's right. usually some sort of stipulation around it, but it says you cannot set that. It doesn't mean a developer can't add parking. So oftentimes a project, you know, it's in an area where there's not transit and actually parking is, it's, you know, it's not going to be marketable with, without parking. So it's fine. You know, you can add the parking, but it just says the city can't artificially create this extra requirement of adding excessive parking. So I go into a lot of detail about this because preview, foreshadowing, I think that we can get parking minimums here in Norfolk and maybe in other places in Hampton Roads. So that's really exciting. But RVA and B got that passed. And so that's a big win that they had that we're hoping to replicate over here. That's really cool. And so locally, we've seen some action on the missing middle issue where there's uh, a new pattern book in the city and yet there's maybe not as many missing middle projects coming to fruition. And we've also seen some movement on parking minimums where there's in select areas kind of lifting of those minimums. Do you think that the path forward is difficult compared to Northern Virginia or Richmond for Hampton Roads? Or do you think it's already moving in that direction and you're hoping to give it more of a push? Can I say both are true? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so Norfolk has the missing middle pattern book, which is great, which means that, you know, our arch local architects and planners are thinking about like how we could add missing middle here. It's not law yet. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the problem. It's still the vast majority of Norfolk, the vast majority of most of the municipalities in Hampton Roads are si single family only. So it is actually illegal to build that duplex, let alone an apartment building. So we need to turn these great ideas about how to build gentle density and missing middle, we need to turn that into actual law. Parking minimums, you know, there's, uh, yeah, like you were saying, so there's parts of Norfolk that do not have parking minimums, but we need to we need to expand that. So we need to actually get this policy change. And, you know, the ideas are great and we need the ideas, but it actually needs to turn into policy. And that takes politics. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if it's harder than in Nova and RVA, it's probably about the same in the sense that just change is hard in general and change takes political will. And the only way it's going to happen is if you get people, community members who are loudly pushing for this. That's the only way it's going to happen. You can try to do some sort of like well, you know, we call it sort of inside baseball lobbying. You know, you can try to get if you have a sympathetic city manager or, you know, a city council, you kind of you know, talk to people in the city council and they're sort of interested. You can kind of maybe squeak through some modest changes that way. And we certainly that's part of the puzzle. We certainly have to figure out who in the city councils are, you know, are useful or are likely to be supportive of this. But what we really need is to get real lasting change that's going to be meaningful and that's going to be significant and that's going to really address the housing shortage. We need to build a movement. We need to build, you know, tons of activists who are calling for this and contacting those city council people and telling them that, yes, we need missing middle. We need no parking minimums. We need this kind of change. And so that's what Yimby Hampton Roads does is we're we're building the movement. 
Yeah, that's that's incredible. And so building that kind of coalition to make change happen is not a small task, but you all also aren't, you're a nonpartisan organization, right? So I feel like your coalition maybe wouldn't fall on the typical political axis. Can you tell us about what kind of folks are coming together and what kind of groups you see coming together underneath the kind of YIMBY banner to, you know, fight for affordable housing? Yeah, so YIMBYs are anyone who thinks the housing shortage is bad. <laughs> they might be personally affected by that. A lot of us are. Or they might be someone who, you know, has for whatever reason sort of lucked out, you know, and is a good sit- housing situation themselves, but is really concerned about the fact that artists and teachers can no longer, you know, live near the jobs. So anyone who cares about the housing shortage and anyone who really sees the benefit of dense cities where we have abundant housing. So those are often people who are sort of in the, we use the term urbanist, people who love cities. You know, there's maybe people who like love biking and walking and hate driving and they want to see dense areas where it's actually possible to bike and walk around. You don't need cars to get around. They might be environmentalists are big in this, environmentalists who look to the facts to say that, okay, the number one thing that local and state governments can do to address climate change is is land use, is changing how our cities and towns are constructed so that people can actually live close to their jobs and we don't have to commute by car so much. It's the number one thing that local and state governments can do. So a lot of environmentalists are inter- interested in this, you know, anti-poverty, anti-homelessness advocates, because this is really such a key foundational thing to do to make sure that people have access to jobs and access to services and opportunities. And then there's that's sort of I'm talking about the progressive side of things. There's also kind of the more, you know, maybe sort of on the right side of politics, people who want to be able to use their property for what they want. You know, so if they want to build an, an accessory dwelling unit, an ADU in their backyard, again, in most of Hampton Roads, that's illegal. You can't do that. So if you want to build something to rent out or if you want to build something for, you know, your aging mother-in-law, you can't do that anymore. You have to you have we would have to change the laws to allow ADUs. So that's so people who want, you know, want to be able to monetize their property a little bit more. People who believe in a stream, you know, effective governance people who believe in a streamlined process that things that are good for the community should happen as opposed to going through endless veto points and endless process. So those people are excited about this. And the YIMBY ideal is to bring all these people together and to advocate for abundant housing and policies that allow for abundant housing. It does mean that we're a big tent. So there are definitely people in the YIMBY tent who do not agree with with each other over everything. You definitely get all sides of the political spectrum. You get people who would completely vote for different candidates at the federal level, but they might vote for the same candidates at the local and state level because they're voting on the issue of housing, which is often determined at the local and state level. So yeah, so a lot of like what we do is sort of build bridges. It's one of the things that's really exciting to me about YIMB because it feels like in our current environment, it's very politically polarized and it's nice to work on an issue that like really is cross-partisan. Yeah, that is kind of refreshing given the climate that we're in these days. You mentioned working kind of too on state issues. I know we've talked a lot about kind of some of the local issues of project-based stuff or policy-based stuff. How do you see some of these YIMBY action groups playing out on the state level and what kind of policies uh, come to play there? Yeah, so zoning is an issue that can definitely be impacted by state policy. And I think the ideal is that there are some state policies that uh, allow for up. So, so zoning is basically the set of laws that determine uh, what land can be used for what. And so zoning is where you get this is single family only or apartments are allowed here or this is a commercial zone. You can't build any residential. So that's kind of the set of laws. So when we talk about we have a slogan often called legalized housing, which basically means chain, changing zoning laws to allow for housing and especially for that multifamily housing for those apartment buildings. So you can get zoning laws at the state level that are really useful. So for example, the state can say all areas that are within, you know, a half a mile of a transit station, you have to allow 
X units. You have to allow, you know, up to, let's say, 10 units um, near them. And so that would be a state law that would basically say that all of the local zoning is completely overridden at the state level. That's probably the more ambitious type of thing. There was a big law in California um, called SB 50 that tried to do that. It was so big and so bold and so ambitious, and the movement was too young to really get it across the finish line that uh, it did not pass, and it, you know it got some backlash. But you know, something like that can and should happen. What you often see at the state level is a little bit more modest, which is, for example, ADUs everywhere, you know, so or ADUs in certain areas. So it says, you know, that situation where you're a homeowner and you want to build a backyard cottage for your aging mother-in-law, it's currently illegal. The state could set a law that says, actually, it has to be legal. The city has to allow you to do that. So it's like sort of an override of local zoning laws by the state that can be really, really, really useful. And we definitely advocate for that. And we definitely want to see some of that. The other thing the state can do is it can density bonuses are a really positive thing. So density bonuses will say, OK, in certain situations, you're allowed to build higher. So it's kind of a sort of trickier way to get around local zoning. But it basically says in certain certain situations, you can build more units. So often it's related to affordability. So it often says, like, you know, if you have... 20% of the units are income qualified, which means that they're restricted to people below a certain income level. If you if the developer proposes a project that does that, they can get higher density. They can get, you know, 20 more units or whatever it might be. And that can be really, really useful because it's a way to allow for density, but also ensure that, you know, you're you're making sure that density, you know, benefits a, a mixed income and wide range. So often if there's density bonus programs, those are things that the states can do that are really useful. And then, you know, local developers can use them. And then also like permit streamlining. So the process, again, it has to be fair. It has to be reasonable. It can't be this excessive over and over again, you know, excessive community meetings. And sometimes the state can be really helpful in streamlining the process. So the state can, for example, set a limit on the number of hearings that you can have. Or the state can say for certain projects, I mean, ideally it should be like all projects, but, you know, start with certain projects, certain projects, if maybe they meet you know, some basic requirements or they have some level of affordability or maybe they're near transit. Those projects are what we call buy right, which means that if they hit all the, the rules, they just get their permits as opposed to a discretionary process where it hits all the rules, but you still have to have the city council approve the project. That's called discretionary. So what the state can do is say, you know, certain projects are by right, which means they just get streamlined. So that's really useful. And yes, like part of the problem is, you know, we have, I mean, do you know how many, how many municipalities does Virginia have? There's Hundreds? like over a hundred and something counties, yeah, 120 counties. Okay. Or, that's, or yeah. So like we can and should and will fight to get change in every single municipality. And <laughs> You know, having the state, especially because, you know, Hamptons Rose is a perfect example, like what happens in Virginia Beach affects what happens in Norfolk and right. affects what happens in Suffolk. And like, you know, those are all separate governments. And so you need a regional approach in a lot of places and the state can provide that. So we want to see local change and we want to see the state, you know, setting these rules that are going to make it easier to build across multiple jurisdictions. So, you know, Norfolk Currents has covered some housing projects in the past and, and talked about new units that are going in. One of the things I think I see most commonly in the comments is people pushing back against what they say are luxury units or, you know, we don't want more, you know, new units that are going to be so expensive in the neighborhood that's only going to make housing affordability even worse. How do you guys respond to those folks who say that maybe, you know, units that are brand new and priced at brand new rates are, are hurting housing affordability? So Yimby supports housing at all levels. We need to have housing that's income qualified for people who are in extreme poverty, and we need it all the way up to those luxury units. And the reason is that actually, if we do not build those luxury units, if we do not build housing at the very high end of the market, 
what will happen is displacement. What will happen is the people who would live in those units, they're going to come anyway, and they're going to take existing housing stock. So, for example, in Hampton Roads, a lot of the people who make you know, the highest income here or sort of income taking everything into account is is military, you know, because you have military and, you know, it's often officers who are decently paid. And then you have the BAH, which allows for, you know, which is can be pretty generous and allows military officers to, you know, buy at that top end of the range. Those people are coming anyway. Those people, I mean, I'm a military spouse. You and know. so for those folks who don't know, BAH is essentially like a housing stipend. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So you'll get like your it's I mean, this is you can look up what every military officer makes online, but they'll have their like base based on their rank. And then they'll have the BH, which is like adjusted for the geographic market where they're living. So, okay. you know, I don't know what it is in Norfolk, but you can you can also look that up. So they have the BH is pretty generous. So they have this sort of like on top of their paycheck, they get this extra housing stipend. And so all these folks, they're coming anyway and they don't have a choice. They're coming here. You know, in fact, we probably want them to come here because because the military adds a lot to the local economy. You know, it's new people, it's new energy. It's like a you know huge part of what makes Hampton Roads Hampton Roads. So they're going to come anyway. If there's no housing for them, they're going to take the housing that does exist and they're going to outbid the people who are currently here. And so then you get those people are going to move into less attractive housing. You know, they're going to move down. And then there's going to be people who are going to be kicked out of the market who are just can't. There's not enough housing stock. You know, we we often talk about housing as sort of a game of cruel musical chairs. You know, you play musical chairs. There's, you know, eight kids and seven chairs and you run and you try to sit down and that eighth kid is not going to get a chair and they have to leave. And that's what the housing market is when you don't have enough housing. And we call it cruel musical chairs because it's, you know, it's not the fastest or arguably most deserving child. It's the richest one. You know, the people at the top, they're going to get the housing and then the people who don't have the resources are going to get kicked out. So we need to build that high end housing to make sure that the people who are coming here anyway, don't take the other housing stock that we're able to accommodate those people. And, you know, this is, I think, once you think about it that way, it's actually, it kind of intuitively makes sense. But you could also look at the evidence. So mm-hmm. there are studies that's, that actually test this, that say, let's say we build luxury housing, you know, luxury housing, like super high-end housing in a particular area. How does how does that actually work out? What actually happens? And what you see is it does reduce displacement that, first of all, rents get lower for everybody. So adding that high end housing actually reduces everybody's housing prices and it reduces the displacement. It reduces people having to leave the community. So this actually has been tested. So luxury housing is good. We at Yimby do know that the market is not going to account for everybody. So, you know, like people who are very, very low income, most people will be able to live in market rate housing. So it might be that new luxury housing that gets built. It might be the housing that gets freed up because that luxury housing gets built. And so people can live in that. But often you have at the very bottom of the market, people who can't afford you know, market rate housing. So we do also support income qualified housing. We support, you know, that's it's often called subsidized affordable because you have to use subsidies to pay for it to get built because the the rents are not going to pay for it. So we need to see everything from that subsidized affordable housing all the way up to that luxury housing if we want to ensure that everybody is housing, that rents are lower, that housing is affordable, and that we don't get displacement. So uh, Yimby Hampton Roads and Yimby Virginia have recently released a a slate of endorsements, kind of endorsing certain politicians who you think are on your side or helpful to the kind of pro-housing cause. Can you tell us more about that recent slate of endorsements? Yeah. So we are very excited that we made our first endorsements. We're endorsing in the state legislature races. The first candidates that we endorsed are Jackie Glass, Phil Hernandez on the delegate side, and then Angelia Graves on the Senate side. And what we did is we sent out a questionnaire to candidates in local races, and we asked them questions about how they think about how adding housing at all levels of the market, like we talked about, how they think about zoning reforms, how they think about permitting reforms. A important one was when they're in state office, they will have an opportunity to hopefully set rules that override some of the local 
you know, local zoning, you know, are they excited about doing that? Would they want to do that? And so we asked these all these questions. In some cases, we had, in addition to a questionnaire, we had real conversations with the candidates to hear their stance on some of this stuff. And we came up with three candidates that we think are, you know, have a lot of aligned views. They really want to see zoning reform to allow more housing, especially in those single family only neighborhoods. They really care about affordability. They really want to set good, strong state rules that are going to make housing easier across Virginia. And yeah, yeah, we're excited to endorse them. And so next steps will be publicizing these endorsements. So if you're the kind of person who's like, I want to, I really care about housing and I want to know who to vote for. We'll tell you who to vote for so you can follow us and listen to our endorsements. So that that's part one. And then second, we really want to make sure that we can use our growing power to get these candidates off the finish line, across the finish line. So we'll be uh, doing volunteering for their campaigns and hopefully some phone banking and door knocking and stuff like that to try to get these candidates across the finish line. That's next up. Yeah, I think it's really important that uh, it's not just a paper endorsement, but it comes off the back of some real conversations and then is followed up with real action on the side of uh, your members. Are you hoping to kind of continue making endorsements in, in future races as well uh, as you look out at you know 2024 with uh, both kind of congressional and a lot of municipal elections coming up? Definitely. Yeah, city council elections are in 2024 and that will be really big. We'll be starting we'll be starting endorsements in the spring and starting to have conversations with candidates. Hopefully we want to do some candidate forums, some candidate meet and greets, like host happy hours and invite candidates, get them a chance to meet our activists. For you all listening who want to meet candidates and really question them on their stance on housing, come come out to those events and you know, be be tough on the candidates. We want to really like hold them to account for their positions on some of these things. And then and then we'll be doing endorsements and similarly doing campaign volunteering around the city council elections. So that'll definitely happen. You know, again, like when we think about how we are going to win on this issue, having people in office who are publicly sticking their neck out necks out for housing like that's a really critical first step once somebody is a yimby endorsed candidate and they say part of my platform is i'm going to be supportive of yimby issues it's a lot easier to work with them when they're in office because you know hopefully they win and we can say they won by being a yimby and so if they ever question if Yimbyism is popular, they don't have to anymore because they won by being a Yimby. And so we know that we can hold them to account for doing ambitious things in housing. So the endorsements are a really critical part of building power and making sure that we get pro-housing policy. Yeah, that's uh, incredible. And, you know, given that here in Hampton Roads, there's seven municipalities with you know, lots of different rules and then lots of races going on. Are you all trying to build a big roster of volunteers? Do you have a lot of folks now? Uh, and what does that look like for you guys going forward? Yes, we need a lot more people. We have a few hundred people on our list right now, which is good. So we have a base to work with. But anyone who is listening who says like, ooh, I'm interested in this. I'm interested in plugging in. I care about these issues. We need you. Absolutely. This is not the type of thing where we can have like a few really dedicated people and win. We need everybody. And your involvement can look like anything from, you know, getting our endorsements and sharing that with your friends, which takes, you know, a couple clicks to you're showing up to phone banking. You know, you're really coming out and being a volunteer. It's fun. It's social. We do happy hours. We try to make it. We have a slack where we can all share ideas and sort of egg each other on. You know, we try to make it fun in a community, but yes, we need everybody. So if you're listening and you want to be part of Yimby Hampton Roads, I'll share more at the end too, but you know, yimbyaction.org, sign up for the mailing list and it'll get on our mailing list and we'll make sure that we we engage you. So that's yimbyaction.org. So how did you personally get involved in the Yimby organization and why are you personally so passionate about it? Yeah. So I am, I'm an urbanist. I'm a, I'm a city mouse. I love cities. I love that you have, you know, communities that are vibrant where there's lots of arts and culture and things to do. I hate driving. So I like to be able to walk places and bike places. I, I grew up outside of New York and my parents are, have also really, really benefited from being New Yorkers and being near a city. They actually met because this was the seventies in New York 
my dad was a teacher and then he decided he wanted to be a teacher. So he quit his job and was like in sort of a like a filmmaker and he would, you know, just sort of do side projects and kind of, you know, fuck around on film and do stuff like that. And because he was in New York, he got access to people and got his foot in the door at NBC and then was able to have this great career working at NBC. And my mom, she was a actress. And so she was an actress living in New York and she waited tables on the side. And actually at that time, the seventies in New York, it was so odd that somebody would be an actress and then also be a waitress and like have a second job, which now is like, are you kidding? If yeah, you're an actress, it seems like that's like, the part that's for the, the course these do. days. Yeah. But in the 70s, it was odd that people would have two jobs. And it was so odd that my dad at, at NBC was actually did a news piece on, isn't this crazy? People who have two jobs <laughs> and they met. Do, you know, doing that piece. And then, you know, they married, they moved to the suburbs, they bought a house and they had this great middle class lifestyle. And it really all happened because they were near an urban hub and they were able to live there even on their sort of starving artists income. They were able to live there and take advantage of a place that had a ton of opportunity. And so, you know, I believe in that. I believe in like there are areas of opportunity where anyone from any walk of life can totally make it. And what we're doing now is we are closing those off and we are saying, no, we are not going to build housing in these areas of opportunity. And so only the people that are at the, you know, the tippity top are able to take advantage and everyone else is shut out. And that's what we're doing right now. And so that bothers me for personal reasons. I've also, I've always worked in nonprofit. I've always worked in often school, like education-based nonprofits. And doing that work, when you try to work in schools and you see how unequal the schools are, and at first I sort of explored, well, you know, there's all these programs that you can add to schools and, you know, let's try to make schools e equal from within schools. And the more work I did with that, the more I was like, when neighborhoods are so unequal and the resources and opportunity and stability in neighborhoods are so unequal, you can't solve the problem just in the schools. So that kind of led me to edu my educational work kind of led me to be like, I want to work in what I think is really the root of the issue, which is housing. And so I was I was living in San Francisco and I was working at a health education nonprofit and I got connected to the YIMBY movement, which was forming in San Francisco. And I said, you know, I want to volunteer with this because I think the more I learn, the more all roads lead back to housing. Housing is the, you know, if you care about poverty, if you care about homelessness, if you care about prosperity, if you care about opportunity, if you care about the climate change, you know, everything, the most important thing that you can work on is housing. So I started volunteering and then I ultimately got a job. So my day job is I work at UMB Action. I work at the parent organization of UMB Hampton Roads. So that's what got me into that. And I moved here uh, in early 2023. I moved here from San Francisco. My husband's in the Coast Guard. So we moved to Norfolk and I moved here and I was like, okay, well, this isn't San Francisco. I was just in San Francisco. San Francisco is terrible. I mean, it is it is really, really bad. The housing is is absolutely catastrophic there. So I moved here and I was like, oh, this will be great. You know, it's it's not San Francisco. And, you know, it's not San Francisco. I mean, we don't have the hom homelessness problem here that we had there. But, it, you know, it's not it's not good here. There's I hear a lot of stories about the you know, about living in Norfolk and living in Virginia Beach and living where the jobs are. And it, and it is too hard to live where the jobs are for too many people. And that is a problem here because we are not building enough housing where the jobs are. There's also sprawl issues. You know, we're not building dense housing near that's clustered near jobs and opportunity. We're spreading out and out and out, which, again, is bad for people's health, is bad for, you know, because of those long commutes. It's bad for the environment because of those long commutes. And, you know, we're in a flood prone area and we will have to really consolidate where the housing is in this area if we want to survive as a region and keep everyone safe. And we're not set up policy wise to do that because it's way too hard to build housing where it can be built. And we need to change that. We need to build, make sure that it's possible to build abundant housing and, you know, build dense housing in the areas where we can build housing so that we can do, you know, smart managed retreat. So it's a problem here and I want to be part of the solution to fix it. And I'm hoping that the people who listen also want to join me in fixing this. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's really good. And you brought up a great point on uh, the managed retreat and kind of resilience happening in Norfolk, you know, 
I think it's a kind of a known factor that over the next, whether it's 10 or 50 or 100 years, there are houses in Norfolk that are probably going to come off the market uh, because people won't be able to live there given the the height of the water or the frequency of the flooding. And that, do you think that raises the urgency of the kind of housing crisis uh, in Norfolk and Hampton Roads more generally? 100% totally. We have to create the policy landscape where if you live in a community that really does need to retreat and you can't live there anymore, you don't have to go to, I don't know, Alabama. You don't have to go somewhere else. You can still be part of the community that is your community. We need to create the policy landscape. And right now we're in a situation where if that were to happen and people need to leave their homes they have to completely leave this region and they have to completely leave, you know, their school and their community and where their family is. Maybe they would have to completely leave. And I don't think we should do that to people. I think we should create a policy landscape where it's possible to build dense, abundant housing and we can just build more housing and we welcome our neighbors to you know rearrange themselves a little bit, but not have to get displaced. So, yeah, we're in a situation where we are extreme risk of displacement, which is bad. And we can solve it by starting now. Awesome. And for those folks who are ready to jump in and get involved, where should they find you and how can they get connected? Yeah. So go to yimbyaction.org and subscribe to the mailing list. That's the best way to do it. That will, you'll enter your name and you'll enter your zip code. And so we'll flag that you're from around here. So that means you'll get invited to our events that we're doing. You'll get action alerts. So if there's a housing project that we're supporting, you can get alerted to that and you can join us in advocating. You'll get to meet the leadership that's working on this and you'll get instantly plugged in. So that's the best way to do it. Go to yimbyaction.org and subscribe, join the list. We'll let you know about stuff that's happening and then then take action. Then join us for an event, you know, click on that action alert. You'll get our endorsements. So take those endorsements, use them in your voting decisions, share them with your friends and colleagues in their voting decisions. And this is how we start. So great. Well, Jillian, thanks so much for being here today. And we're excited to see what happens next with Yimby Hampton Roads.